out of a total of how many interested parties? Oh, I think there was about 28, 29. Thanks. All right, so I am conscious of the time. Uh, so we might get started. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. We're just admitting more people in now. Um, so I would like to start this um, session by acknowledging the traditional owners and First Nations people of the country that we are all calling in from today. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also just wish to highlight the intrinsic connection between our First Nations people and the water um, that we are all talking about in today's session and the importance of self-determination uh, in terms of those in terms of those waters across our countries. Um, so very happy to have people here today. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think we've got a really interesting program and I will hand over to Chris, CEO of Goblin Broken CMA to do the formal introduction. Thank you. Um, thanks, Katie, and I had no idea you were planning to do that. So um, hello, everyone. Chris coming with Golden Broken from Golden Broken CMA. I'm really pleased to be here with you and with um, uh, Northeast CMA and with One Basin CRC to be talking about the project that we've been involved in, the project that we've been um, working on and also to hear a bit more about the One Basin CRC. So I think that's um, pretty all pretty exciting stuff. Uh, I think, are you, are you, were you going to then throw to Paul, Katie, or do you want me to just uh, throw to Paul? You can throw to me, Chris. Okay, we, we will throw to Paul. And I think <laughs> Paul is first going to um, give an update on the Our Water Futures project that the two CMAs have been involved with. Um, it's a project that we've both been really excited to be involved with. It's talking about how do we as water um, water sector involve our communities in the discussions and the decisions that are going to need to be happen uh, with our changing water future. Um, and it's also a project we're passionate about in terms of helping support our communities adapt to changing water futures. So we're pretty, um, pretty excited about that project and then um, after that, we're going to throw to One Base and CRC, who are very much involved in it. So I'll throw to you, Paul, to give an update as, as the key uh, person that's been helping us work through this process and working through the first stages of it. So over to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Katie. Um, and thanks for your support. You know, the leadership that Chris and Katie from the, the two CMAs have shown has been really crucial in this work. So. Um, good leadership's a, a rare thing. Um, yeah, so Paul Ryan's my name. I run a company called the Australian Resilience Centre based in Beechworth uh, and have been working with the two CMAs in various ways over a period of time to um, help to, to convene and coordinate this Our Water Futures process. Um, I'll just share my screen here. Can you see that okay? Uh, yep. Is it on slideshow? Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, so our Water Futures is a, a partnership between the North East CMA and, and Goulburn Broken CMA and, and um, being managed and instigated by Lachlan Campbell and, and Carl Walters at, at the uh, Lachlan at the North East and, and Carl at Goulburn Broken. And again, you know, leadership. And I think it's really shows the role that CMAs can play in convening, bringing people together and just what an important role that is that um, CMAs play in, in bringing together, you know, diverse ranges of stakeholders around particular issues and in this case around water, something that's central to, to all of us. Um, I don't, I'm not going to give a, you know, a lot of background here, but 
you know, to, especially to a group like this that's on this call. But clearly, the, the context for this work that we've been thinking about um, from a biophysical point of view, we've got reduced inflows, increased variability, and you know, increased uncertainty about future dynamics about water supply. So, you know, as a starting point, just that biophysical context. And if you look at that graph on the right hand side, we're really we're really uncertain about whether that step change that we've seen since the year 2000, about a 40% reduction in inflows to the Murray, um, is that step change going to persist into the future? If it does, that's a significant challenge for, for all of us, for all of our communities. Um, or is it going to flip back to the long-term average from 1900 to 2000? We, we really simply don't know, or maybe it's going to step down even further. The, the, the dynamics around water are really unclear uh, and uncertain, and that represents a challenge for organisations like the ones on the call when you're trying to think long-term and plan uh, and provide certainty that those sort of dynamics represent some you know, significant challenges for us. Um, there's also some really significant challenges in the socio-political context here. So we know we've got increased demand for water, rapidly changing land use, um, you know, for a whole range of reasons. So we've seen significant shifts in industries like the dairy industry and the Golden Broken, but we're also seeing, you know, a, a kind of counter shift, if you like, where people are trying to move back up above the choke to get, um, you know, higher water security. We've also seen a, a shift in in um, lifestyle and and um, you know associated with the pandemic and and the the values around lifestyle that are increasing. Um, and as as Katie mentioned at the start, you know the the important and I think something we should celebrate the recognition of First Nation values and um, First Nation access and justice, um, increasing improving justice and access to water. They're, they're things that we should celebrate and we should be embracing, but they also represent challenges because they are a change. Again, another change to the, the dynamics of the operating environment that we're working in. Positive ones, changes that we welcome, but they also represent cha uh, challenges for us to think about those changes. And of course, contested narratives. We're talking about a highly contested resource. Um, we've seen the undermining of the, the science, the, the politics that's played through water and those sorts of things. So for organisations like ours that are trying to work at this regional scale to, to think about uh, water, water dynamics and particularly how we adapt to that variability or an uncertain water future, it's, this, is a, this is a complex space to be operating in. Um, so in that context, our water futures is a process. Um, it, that's about bringing together people to think about um, creating a shared understanding of the adaptation needs of our communities right. and our roles as water agencies in addressing those needs. And <clears throat> I really want to stress the point of, you know, we've been we've been pretty good at understanding needs. I think you know, people who want information from us or through science we've identified gaps or challenges. So the needs part, I think, is something we're fairly adept at. The bit I think that's still really challenging for us is to understand our roles in addressing those needs. And, and I talk about those roles as individual organisations and as you know a, a set of organisations that are interacting. How do we go about addressing those needs as those needs, adaptation needs continue to change? It's also really important to recognise that, you know, that the agencies are part of the system, a significant part of the system. They, they manage the resource. They play a key role in, you know, how that resource gets used and distributed across the landscape and how policy translates into practice, all of those things. The agencies themselves are a fundamental part of the system and the people, you know, right down to the fact that the people who work in those agencies are the community as well. They're parts of the community as well and they have a key role in their communities, um, you know, in, in both working in agencies, but also being in, in organisations and in um, other, you know, parts of their communities. And so recognising that sort of multi-dynamical role that um, the organisations and people in those organisations play in this system. In, in practice, our water futures, what does it look like in practice? It's about, someone mentioned this in one of the workshops that we had earlier, it's about collaborating, cooperating, coordinating and communicating. And if we do that well as a set of organisations that manage, you know, the, the resource or have key roles in managing the water resource, 
that will go a long way to be able to meet those needs um, of our community. So if we can focus on our ability to collaborate, cooperate, coordinate and communicate together um, and with our communities of interest, then we go a long way towards meeting those needs. Um, and so the participating organisations to date, um, you'll see that the kind of spread here from the, the federal scale through to the local scale, which is something that's I think fundamentally important. Water is a multi-scale issue. It crosses lots of scale boundaries. And so we need to have those players in the room. Um, and I'd also just to draw your attention to the, the fact that we've got um, you know, one base in CRC, and we'll hear from Mike shortly, uh, ANU, Melbourne Uni and La Trobe as knowledge partners, you know, participating in these conversations. And we really thank them for their participation it's you know they're, they're acting in good in good faith there's no dollars on the table here in terms of their participation they've just because people are passionate and interested um, and they've been participating in that context and that's been really valued and welcomed by you know the rest of the the organizations around the table you'll also note that there's there's not first nations representation here um, and that's because through this process first the first nations participation is is sort of being um, managed through a, a separate process but at some point we want those two processes to merge um, and you'll also note that organizations that you might expect like local governments for example who play a key role in um, you know, integrated water management, for example, and planning, those sorts of things, they're not represented either. Um, it's not that they're deliberately excluded, but we thought in the first instance, it's we need to get together as a set of organisations that uh, work directly on water to, to get our story straight, to understand the lay of the land from our perspective. Um, and it may be down the track that those other organisations, um, you know, become part of this process. We also deliberately haven't included stakeholder groups like, you know, irrigation lobby groups or recreational groups or whatever. Um, again, this is about us understanding the system from our perspective and in relation to one another about these organisations that are represented here before we actually go out and try to, you know, engage and uh, incorporate those other perspectives. So that might come down the track, but in the, in the first instance, you know, we've got to walk before we can run. Uh, the, the, the focus of the work is is in the two CMAs mentioned and, and again, you know, we're highly cognizant of the fact that, you know, we're part of a bigger system. We know the importance of these two regions. They represent 5% of the land area of the basin, but, um, you know, generate 50% of the flows to the Murray. These two regions are fundamentally important to the, to the health and well-being of the whole Murray system, but we also need a scale that we can work at and we think we can manage and think about things at this scale. Um, you know, we've got good relationships, very strong relationship between these two CMAs to work on these issues together. Uh, there's a lot of common landscapes and, and um, a lot of common issues that we, we already work on together. And so it's a logical kind of thing to have these two CMAs um, working closely together on this, on this work. Um, just quickly, the process, so we've had four sessions one of those was a short online session this was back during the pandemic so it was a, a, a relatively um, short face-to-face -face session to kind of frame up how we're trying to think about this our water futures process so particularly emphasizing understanding boundaries and the scales and and you know the the conversation was had about the linkage between these these um cmas and the rest of the <clears throat> you know the landscape um but again, the decision was, well, we've got to put some boundaries around this. We've got to make it workable. Session two was about understanding the current adaptation work that's been undertaking, undertaken across regions. And just to doc document that, we haven't done that to date in the past. So this was the first opportunity to sort of be in a room and say, what do we know is happening about uh, the current adaptation work? <clears throat> Session three was about what the future challenges might look like. Um, for our communities and what they might face. And then session four was about, well, how do we, given, you know, the previous conversations, how do we think about <clears throat> the best way to work together to address um, and support our communities through that adaptation challenge? And in particular, um, I guess we identified this um, emerging or 
um, pending planning opportunities as a key sort of window of opportunity. And I'll talk briefly about that more in the future. <clears throat> um, I, I think most people on the call would have seen this report. If you haven't, um, you can just yell out and we'll send it to you. It's a really short working document to capturing the key outputs from the, the workshops, but that's what I'm referring to, going to refer to in these next couple of slides. So this information's in that report. <clears throat> um, just quickly, the emerging some really important, you know, emerging insights. <clears throat> there's nothing new here, but there's lots of adaptation taking place, but it's often ad hoc and very reactive, and, and that's not a criticism. You know, we are reacting to these extreme events, and <clears throat> that's got us locked into a, a, um, a kind of reactive mode. It's hard to break out of, you know, and we all recognise that, and as these you know significant events continue to happen we we have to respond to them but but that also means we're in a reactive mode and we're not necessarily looking a long way ahead and that's a real challenge <clears throat> um the adaptation actions not evenly spread across sectors and so you know we know in things like um you know the ag sector clearly there's been a lot of work done on adaptation and and as there should be it's an important driver of our whole regional economy and regional health and well-being but we also, you know, partly dependent on who's in the room, but we also recognise there's some significant gaps around things like tourism, which is fundamentally important for our regions. We're not aware of, you know, much work at all taking place in terms of adaptation to a different water future in those sectors. And so there's some some gaps that we need to, to address. Um, also really important here is that Adaptation requires ongoing support, and we know that's a challenge when you, you know, with the political cycle and funding cycle that we have, that these aren't things that are you do, you know, set and forget. You do one action and walk away. That it's an, a need for ongoing adaptation, and and that's a real challenge um, when you think about the way our systems are set up to support adaptation. Doing adaptation over a long period of time is is a challenge. <clears throat> um, you know, we know this, obviously, the spatial and temporal patterns of water are changing, but our mindsets, our legislation, some of our policies and our practices are typically based on those past averages. And, and so we're in a transition period. If we are looking at a sort of 40% reduction in inflows, well, you know, we need to fairly rapidly shift our mindset to, to that challenge rather than, you know, thinking we're going to go back to where we were in the past or thinking that, you know, it won't be good when we get back to to normal. Well, if we're talking about a new normal, we need to fairly rapidly sort of pull our thinking and our legislation policies in line with that um, towards what the future holds, not what the past was about. Water management is, is you know, replete with legacy issues. So from decisions made 100 years ago, um, time lags, tipping points and unintended consequences. So that's, that's the, these are the kind of um, hallmarks of complexity and adopting a complexity perspective, I think, is something that we're going to have to push towards, which is to really, you know, think about this through a complexity lens because of the complex interactions, because of those um, dynamics that are listed there that, you know, have we got the right sort of frame to think about water management? And so, the, you know, the workshops highlighted some of the challenges around this. We've got changing community dynamics and the values, um, you know, that those changing values. It represents challenges for engaging and working to find solutions. We know that science has been undermined, that the information ecosystem is, is incredibly messy. If you Google anything around water, you, you know, you're not sure who are the trusted sort of sources of information. Uh, and trust in institutions is decreasing and, you know, at a time when we need more trust and we're asking people to trust us with some really complex processes, um, you know, trust is at an all-time low. The other really crucial thing that came out of these workshops is the importance of these pending planning processes. So the Basin Plan Review and the Northern Swiss are, you know, major windows of opportunity to progress regional adaptation thinking and practice. So these are, you know, significant vehicles for us to really have new conversations and to progress conversations that are hard to progress at other times. So we see these planning opportunities as really crucial to um, you know, progressing adaptation thinking, and so we want to maximise our opportunity through those through those planning uh, processes. Um, 
So four kind of key actions or groups of actions emerged out of these conversations from these four workshops. One is around refining and socialising across agencies, a set of planning and engagement principles. You know, the, the message from this group, and, and I'd hope most people on this call would support this, is that, you know, we need to do engagement well um, for a whole range of reasons. And, and all of us in, in this workshop process identified the fact that we haven't done it well in the past. There's been times when we've really done it very poorly. And then that limits our ability, you know, to engage with people in the future because we've burnt that trust or we've got, you know, engagement fatigue or distrust in processes, et cetera. I, I'm, so this is my personal opinion. What I'd really like to see is for all of the agencies involved from, from every scale to adopt a set of planning and engagement principles about how we'll work. I'd like to see us evaluate ourselves against those planning principles. And I'd also like to have a community panel or a panel of experts help evaluate our practice against those principles and to make that publicly available as one of the shortest routes, I think, to improve our practice and improve accountability of all of our organisations towards engagement. Um, I, I think that would be, a, you know, a, a fairly um, game-changing kind of thing to do, and I think it would be a brave thing to do, and it takes courage to create change, and I think that's an opportunity to exercise courage. So I'd, I'd put that challenge to all of the kind of leaders of organisations on the call and engage in water planning. That's something that we can do. Um, the, the other thing that came out was the idea that we need to really map the communities of interest. So really to understand, like I said, we've got a dynamic social context. Who are the communities of interest? What are the emerging planning opportunities and how do those planning processes and opportunities intersect with those communities of interest? And so being really clear about you know, who do we need to engage with around what, why and when um, and making sure that we're doing that in a way that is fair, transparent um, and provides the opportunity and, and uh, access for people to those processes. Um, Action three was around scoping the Wine Basin CRC project, and we'll hear more about that in a minute from Mike. And we've already done a lot of that scoping work in the meantime. The next kind of phase of our water futures will be to start to work on that quick start project, but we'll hear more about that in a minute. Um, and then finally, this issue around just capacity building for agencies uh, and communities of interest. We know that, um, for example, you know, First Nations, um, communities are being hit on to provide all this input into these processes and yet their capacity to do that is limited and so we need to build capacity for First Nations groups you know or with First Nations groups to to you know allow them to participate in the, the level they want in these processes for example so there's issues about just purely allowing people uh, or creating the opportunity and capacity for people and organisations and communities of interest to participate but we also know we need to improve our own capacity. So our, our capacity for adaptation thinking is relatively low, and that's not a criticism, it's just a fact. Um, we need to improve our capacity within our organisations. And so one of the things we're planning to do as part of this Our Water Futures is, is to have you know, some sort of process of capacity building, whether that's webinars, you know, hands-on sessions or whatever, to expose people to a range of tools and, and actions uh, and um, tools and, and um, uh, um, processes that we can use to improve our practice around adaptation. Uh, next step, so where to for our water futures? So we've got two further workshops planned. Um, and like I say, I don't want to overemphasise workshops as the only only work that gets done. This is a process and a process that will keep evolving over time, but there are two workshops planned. We really want to focus on those windows of opportunity, the planning windows of opportunity that are, are pending and, and um, make sure we maximise those. And some of the work we need to do, you know, in the very near future is this initial mapping of the decision making context that um, and understand the decision making ecosystem and potential barriers to adaptation that um, is going to be explored through the quick start project with one basin and again that's a real opportunity to understand you know how do we actually interact with the water system what decisions are made and how do we make those decisions who makes those decisions and what are the interactions between the decisions and starting to sort of you know, pull apart the spaghetti of that complexity and starting to be clear about, you know, who plays what role where. 
So <clears throat> that's a pretty pretty quick fly through um, of our water futures. I'm happy to take any quick questions now, but we've also got some time at the end for conversations around anything I've just talked about. Has anyone got any any quick questions now that they'd like to raise or? Sounds like we're all good there, yep. Paul. Um, I might you. You, take, yep. take uh, over again. Um, and thank you, Paul. That's uh, been a really good overview of what we've been working on and where we're up to. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning that for those that you don't, don't know him, although most of you will, that Paul Ryan is from the Australian Resilience Centre. So he has spent many years working with uh, the CMAs and many others um, supporting resilient um, approaches, uh, helping communities respond to change and to flourish. So we're very uh, pleased to have Paul part of this project. And, and um, you can see just from that brief update that uh, we're already well on the way in these conversations and, and realise there's some big challenges here that we need to get our heads around to then support our communities. So I notice that there's quite a few in the chat that have been asking for a copy of the report. I don't think there's any reason why that just can't be shared with everyone that's dialed into um, to this, this session. So we'll get that out to you all. Um, we're going to have an update from the One Basin CRC now. Um, one ba Basin CRC is a new national consortium of more than 85 partners across the agriculture, environment, water and technology centres sectors in the Murray-Darling Basin. Um, that includes industry, it includes business, government, research, not-for-profit organisations and all the CMAs in, the, in Northern Victoria are actually partners in the CRC, as are quite a number of the water corporations. So we're all very uh, connected into what the CRC's purpose is, which is basically to grow value from water in a changing world. Um, this is apparently uh, and, and I think uh, quite rightly um, the claim is there that this is the first researcher partnership of its kind in the basin. Um, for those that you aren't aware, there's a budget of 156 million over 10 years for the CRC to deliver industry-led research and train our next generation of leaders and decision makers. So we're pretty fortunate to have um, the, C the, the CRC was successful and to have them working with us. Uh, as has already been mentioned, I think I said that at the beginning, the Our Water Futures project is partnering with the One Basin CRC, which is undertaking a project to, to that that's supporting this, that's going to help build our capacity to adapt to a more variable water future. So it's pretty um, exciting what's happening here and, and the broader work that the CRC will be doing. We've got the CR, CRC's CEO, Professor Mike Stewartson here, um, and I keep looking to the top corner because that's where you are, Mike, on my, on my screen. Um, and the Director, Partner and Engagement, Sharon Davis, who are going to provide an overview of the CRC, a uh, bit of an update and an outline the opportunities for current and potential new partners. So I'll hand over to both of you. Thanks, Chris and, and, and Paul, uh, Lachlan uh, and Carl for um, organising this event and, and having us along to, to chat. It's been great to be part of the Our Water Futures um, project and we're looking forward to having a bigger involvement through the Quick Start project. It's really well aligned with um, the kind of work the CRC wants to do. So it's 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 kind of it's it's for us. It's the ideal situation where um, regional agencies are coming together and, and, and looking for the kind of um, support that the research support that the CRC can provide. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes and then Sharon's going to talk for about five minutes um, about partner engagement and then there'll be plenty of time left for some questions um, at the end. I'm going to start back uh, at uh, early but I don't know, there's probably people on the, on the line who don't know a lot about the CRC so I'll move through that quickly and then talk a bit about our planning processes and how partners get involved in the CRC. I, I can't get into much detail because the time available, so I'm sorry for those who already know a fair bit about the CRC. This might be, um, um, uh, you, you might be frustrated that I don't get into some of the, the detail around the project areas we'll be working on. So, um, CRC program has been um, a, a, a Commonwealth program since 1991. I actually did my PhD in one of the first CRCs, the CRC for Cashman Hydrology. Um, so it's been around for a while. They've been running, in recent years, the Commonwealth's been funding about three CRCs each year from a pool of about 15 applications that uh, that get through um, 
their first round. Um, our partnership was funded um, in the most recent round, which was which meant that we started, we sort of commenced in the middle of last year and we're in an establishment phase, which ends more or less in the middle of this year. Um, we run for 10 years from the middle of last year, so it's a 10 year, a 10 year initiative. It's pretty unusual to get 10 years of support for a, a program like this and, and a real privilege and one where we're very much aware of the, the responsibility that goes along with uh, leading, um, leading this unique um, opportunity. Now I'm just going to share my screen um, and go through a few slides here. Project Bash. Good. Our vision is that Australian irrigation basins are the most productive, resilient and sustainable in the world. And I want to be clear that our scope here is really about um, the whole basin, including source areas, um, irrigation areas and downstream. Um, uh, so it's not just irrigation regions, it's the whole basin that we're interested in. And our purpose, obviously, is a lot of different organisations that have that shared vision. And our purpose is around working together to grow value from water in a changing world. And Paul talked about some of those changes which are particularly relevant um, in the northeast that have uh, motivated the, the Our Water Futures project. Um, we've got uh, around 85 partners in the CRC. They come from the agriculture, water, um, technology and environmental sectors. Uh, we've got a range of end user organizations, commercialization partners, because of course the CRC is not just interested in um, doing the research, but actually driving the adoption of that research. So we've got partners that can help us um, in that space. And then the knowledge agencies. So six universities, CSIRO is involved. We've got um, some uh, uh, vocational training providers um, and a number of others in that, in that space. So 85 partners, um, uh, we've got $50 million in cash from the government um, over that 10 year period, 35 million cash committed by our partners and 60 million in kind from our partners. And the in kind is really critical because what the real strength is here at the CRC is the partnership and the way we realise that value is through the, um, the contribution of in kind um, from our partners. We've got to focus on First Nations inclusion. Our board, um, it's, a, it's an incorporated um, not-for-profit um, entity and our board includes two First Nations directors. We are establishing a First Nations team within the, um, the management of the, of the CRC and we'll have First Nations representation in our regional hubs, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and, and in our projects. Um, really, our opportunity here is to normal, normalise participation of First Nations in basin science and, and recognising that Victoria has been a, a real leader in First Nations engagement and inclusion in water management, and the CRC is an opportunity to, to, to build on that. I want to highlight three features of the CRC, which uh, I guess describe our approach. Um, and, and the context here is we're, 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 very, we're very clear that it's not just about what we work on, but how we work on those problems that's, that's important. Um, and so we've got three particular um, elements to our approach, which I want to highlight. Uh, Recognising that the, the problems that we're going to be working on are complex, wicked problems. Um, Paul's already referred to that in the context of the Northeast. Um, so um, our scale of, of funding at the partnership and the time allows us to think differently about how we deliver an R&D program that's aligned with the scale and complexity of the challenges that we're addressing. So we don't see the CRC as simply a, um, a sort of a grant funding program. We get people coming to us with bids and we fund them. We're really thinking about how we can leverage um, the resource in the CRC to tackle some of these complex um, systemic challenges. So the first thing I want to highlight is our regional focus. Um, we've got a commitment to being part of communities where we work, um, staying the course over the 10 years. This is not just a come in, do a project and leave. We understand that one project will almost certainly lead on to, to other challenges that need to be addressed with follow on projects. So we've got a 10 year um, uh, opportunity to stay, to stay the course with regional communities and, um, and to shape projects to fit within that regional context. Um, uh, we think that sort of being context specific for our projects is really critical uh, and it's also critical for building trust in the solutions that we develop. Um, so we've got four regional hubs that we're establishing at the moment in Loxton, hosted by Perz Asadi in South Australia, in Mildura, hosted by the Mallee Regional Innovation Centre and Sunny TAFE, in Griffith, 
hosted by Murrumbidgee Irrigation and in Gundawindi, um, hosted by the Gundawindi Council. Um, uh, but we're also um, uh, keen to work in other parts of the basin. Uh, it's not just in those regions that we're in those sort of specific locations that we'll be working. So we do have an intent to work across across the basin. Um, and we'll have nodes that will establish um, around certain projects um, as well. So the kind of work we're doing here um, in the northeast can sort of be reflected in, in a node for the CRC. There, there is the opportunity to establish new regional hubs if there's sufficient interest and support in a region. And um, I have got a couple of regions where that's of interest. I think that's that's a potential area of interest in the northeast as well. Um, and so certainly happy to continue to have uh, conversations around um, around those regional hubs. I'd like to think these hubs could be a legacy from the CIC that we've established the um, the capability and the relationships, um, the value of these hubs that they have an ongoing life um, past past the end of the CRC. I should say what is a hub before I move on. Um, there'll be staff by regional hub manager. There'll be research staff there, including PhD students. Uh, but importantly, there'll also be a regional hub um, advisory committee, which will be made up of local local people from our partnership and beyond, um, who will be uh, guiding. Um, the selection and approval and, 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 and um, uh, implementation of, of projects. And one of the things we're really committed to is that any project um, uh, for it to be funded would need to be endorsed by one of our regional advisory commit committees. So there's a really strong regional voice uh, in the project um, selection process for, our, for, for the CRC. The second area I wanted to highlight is our systems approach. Uh, the challenges we're addressing are typically um, across sort of the, the normal boundaries that we work within, within government, within research and with industry. And if we take a narrow view in defining and responding to these challenges, then these solutions will, will sort of fall into some of the, the, the challenges that we've experienced in the past. So that's why we're taking a holistic approach in defining out uh, the challenges that we're going to tackle. It's, it's, it's a holistic approach in terms of the partnership we assemble to tackle these challenges and the disciplines and knowledges that we'll draw on. Um, many of our projects are going to combine technical, environmental and social dim dimensions. I'm often asked, you know, is this CRC about the environment, about, the agri about agriculture? Is it about regional development? Um, and my answer is that, that that we can't divide these things, that they all have to be considered, um, or the opportunity for the CRC at least, is to consider these three areas together um, because they're, they're strongly overlapping. Um, there are precedents where other R&D programs have embraced this sort of systems approach. Um, Land and Water Australia, which closed in 2009, is one um, probably uh, leading example, but also the Irrigation Futures CRC um, began to take this approach and that ended in, in 2010. The MDBC at the time, um, the SINE program ended in 2005, also had the systems approach. And, and internationally, ACR also works across these three domains. So we've we're drawing on the examples from these previous um, very well regarded programs to learn how we can do this kind of systemic um, work uh, in the basin well. The third area I wanted to highlight is the um, is that we're applying a theory and practice of change approach to the design of our programs and projects. We're taking a three stage process to um, designing our program, um, which we're uh, well advanced through in this sort of first year of the CRC. And we'll be cycling through this planning process um, multiple times over the life, over the 10 year life of the CRC. Um, our partners are collected in the first stage, our partners are collectively identifying the challenges that the CRC will tackle and then working together to design a program uh, plan, um, which is underpinned by program logic. Um, to address these challenges and then we'll move forward to a project uh, co-design with our partners. So we move from uh, all, all three stages involve participation from our partnership. We move more from a, um, a consultation stage to a, to a full participation and co-design process at the project level as we go through the process. And the, the sort of conversation narrows with smaller groups of partners around project areas um, in the later stages of the planning process. Um, we recognise that partners um, need to engage with us in different ways and, and, and will have different preferences in the way they engage and when they can engage. So we're using a range of different um, modes of engagement, including um, direct conversations, uh, workshops, 
uh, reports to be reviewed, um, online uh, consultation and so on. So there's a range of different things we're doing to make sure partners can, can contribute in to this planning process. Um, this is that process just in a little bit more detail because I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about uh, the, the planning process we're on this year and where we're up to in that planning process and, and so the opportunities for partners to be involved um, going forward. Those, this red box um, is the challenge identification stage, which we went through in the in the first half of this financial year, so from August to to um, to January, um, and we worked with our partners through a series of regional forums to identify the challenges that they're interested in. We synthesised those challenges and consulted with our partners over that synthesis of the challenges, and then we asked our challenge our partners to nominate which challenges they really wanted to work on, and they could distribute their interest and their investment across the uh, the challenges that were identified through this process. Through that process, we identified four challenges that our partners want to work on in this first sort of three year cycle um, of the CRC. And I'll, I'll show those here on this slide. Um, so these are um, building capacity to respond with climate change together and the Our Water Futures Quick Start project sits within this challenge. Um, creating value from digital technologies to support um, irrigated agricultural sector, recognising there's a lot of technologies, technologies around, but there's sort of poor uptake of those technologies. So we're really interested in how we can overcome the barriers to adoption of those technologies. Um, enhancing water supply systems to deliver for multiple uses um, is another, another challenge that's identified. And the final one is realising value from and within rural industries and communities recognising that there's a sort of transformation underway in the economies of these um, of these regional areas and particularly around the opportunities around environment the provision of environmental services. The percentages you can see at the end of these dot points are the relative weightings of the interest across our partners um, weighted by their investment um, and so you can see the kind of spread of interest um, across the four areas from our partnership and we'll be investing in those four challenges um, according to that, that, that interest. So we're, we're firmly committed to following the, the priorities of our partners in the way that we invest um, the CRC's uh, resources. We've now also gone through the, the program planning phase that was um, uh, in the um, in the sort of the January, February to through to um, March, April uh, quarter. Um, and we went again through a consultation process. We set up working groups um, with uh, all our partners having the opportunity to participate and be consulted by those working groups. Um, we, uh, we put out draft discussion papers and now we have program plans which have been approved by our partner forum and by the board uh, for each of those four challenge areas. And those program plans lay out the focus areas that we want to work on um, uh, over the first um, period of the CRC. And, and across those four challenge areas, we've identified 24 um, focus areas um, to, 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 to organise our next stage of project co-design around. Now, when, when we put these plans to our um, partner forum and to the board for approval um, uh, over the last fortnight, um, they all got endorsed and approved. But really the message is, is for us to then look at ways of um, amalgamating and combining some of these different areas to have more significant um, pieces of activity that have a, a higher level of, of impact. Um, so trying to build the scale of effort around fewer areas. So um, in this next stage of planning, which I'll talk about in a moment, we're looking at how we can kind of how we can amalgamate our work in these different focus areas around particular um, areas of, 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 of interest. Sorry, my lights are on a movement sensor and they go out, which is a bit and frustrating. Um, okay, so that was the program planning. The final stage is project co-design, and that's the one we're just moving into now. It's a pretty exciting stage, but it's where the conversations move outside of our leadership team down into project teams. And so a, a real opportunity for all our partners to get deeply involved in project co-design. Over the next three months, we're really building the foundation for um, 
probably for the, the life of the CRC in terms of the, the relationships, the partnerships, the sort of the, the, the priority areas for each partner to be focused into um, and, 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 and the initial projects um, for the next uh, the next stage of the CRC. So it's a, a critical three months. And one of the things uh, messages I'm giving to our partners is this is the time to really get involved in uh, in guiding um, the CRC into in your areas of priority. Um, now, some of the focus areas, I'll talk a little bit about that, the project co-design in just a sec. I'm not going to go through the focus areas in any great detail. I'm just going to flash through a few slides just to give you a feel for the, the, the what they, they broadly, um, the scale of them and what they look like. So one of those areas is building community understanding of healthy waterways in the face of climate change. Another focus area for our second challenge is identifying adoption pathways to define and implement effective digital solutions. Um, in the for challenge three, we've got a focus area around enhancing information systems to support multiple productive environmental and cultural benefits. And in challenge four, we've got a focus area around evaluating the impacts of policies, programs and practices. Um, and so we've got uh, a program plans which have a lot more detail for each of these focus areas and for all 24 focus areas. So they're available for anybody who'd like to um, to get a bit more detail around the different focus areas that we've 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 are included in our in our planning. So we're now in this this project co-design stage, the final stage of our program planning. Um, we hope to have that completed by um, by September. Um, Importantly, we've got our annual conference um, at the start of August, the first week of August, which will be a really important step in um, drawing that process to a close in terms of the project plans. Through this project, um, there's too much detail on this slide, I'm going to go through all that detail. Um, but for each of our focus areas, the 24 focus areas, there'll be a project team. Partners can join those teams. We'll have an industry um, chair for each of those project teams. They'll work um, through a divergent phase and then a convergent phase to co-design um, projects. There may be one or more in, in, in uh, each focus areas, um, or they may combine across focus areas to work together in a single project. Um, we've designed a process that allows a fair bit of flexibility for the project teams to work amongst themselves and define um, the projects that will be of value. So um, that process is just beginning. We're um, working with uh, research leads as well to support them in, the, in having a successful project co-design um, experience uh, with some training and then we're bringing the partners um, into those project teams under the leadership of, a, of an industry chair for each focus um, group. So we're, we're, we're just starting this process now um, and we expect to have our projects um, plans ready to be approved for, for review at the start of August and then for approval in September. Just to finish off, um, the strengths of the One Basin CRC is that it's an independent um, uh, um, independently governed science-based organisation, so we're well placed to communicate trusted science perspectives. Um, it's a broad public-private sector partnership. That's, uh, I think, a real strength here that we can think not just about the, the government responsibilities around water policy and management, but also private sector responses and adaptation to policy changes and broader changes um, in, in, in climate. Uh, we've got a longev longevity, so we can think about the uh, the longer term and about R and D needs over a ten year period. Um, um, we're regionally based, so we've got, we're in a unique unique positions, unique position to support collaboration um, across sectors in regions, and so we've got those four four regional hubs for us to be able to do that. So that's from 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 my my money. They're the four headlines, the, the real strengths of, of this CRC. I might stop there and hand across to Sharon to say a few words, and then there'll be some time for some questions, I hope. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everyone. And I just want to apologise. I'm up in northeast Victoria, and my internet has decided to go a bit squirrely, as it happen, as happens in regional areas. So I'm going to leave my camera off. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments um, from a partnership perspective. Um, just to really kind of um, follow up Mike's um, overview of the CRC uh, in its entirety. And one of the things I often reflect on um, in terms of partnership is in putting together the CRC bid, we were really focused on designing an organisation that was going to deliver what we and the people that we spoke to through extensive consultation indicated 
was needed for the basin. And that was really about um, doing things differently and, and working in a, in a collaborative way. And I think the comments Paul made on the Our Water Futures project really reflects exactly that sort of sentiment. Um, so in putting together the bid, the two elements uh, respond to that. Inclusion and collaboration uh, are a really critical part of the CRC's value proposition. And I think the opportunity of a 10 year horizon for investment is the opportunity to really build uh, a new way of doing things. And I think the other point to make there is that the number of partners in the CRC, 85, which often um, sort of raises um, interested eyebrows, is that um, th that reflects the kind of commitment and approach to getting everyone around the table. It was very much, a, um, that might make it sound a bit more complicated and a bit more challenging, but actually that's part of the value proposition is to get to get people involved and participating. So I'm really excited about the opportunity that that, that provides for the basin. We're mindful and we're purposefully being ambitious about, about what we're doing and particularly about how we design and run genuinely aim to have industry-led research programs, genuinely um, the ambition of really uh, setting up an organisation that's that's collaborative, that listens, that, that all our partners see the One Basin CRC as a we, you know, it's our organisation collaboratively, that's our, that's our ambition. We're probably not always going to get it right, um, but we're really excited about the opportunity that a new organisation like this, based in a research environment, which gives us a chance to kind of explore and test and learn, learn and adapt and do that over a 10 year horizon, I think is, is a really um, exciting, exciting proposition. And the other piece that I think I just really wanted to highlight is this is also education and training is always a part of a CRC program and, and, it's, and it's an important part of our CRC. And this is the great opportunity to train the next generation of leaders and decision makers um, and train them in an environment that's one of partnership and collaboration um, and regional, uh, regionally based in a regional perspective. And, and I, like Mike, did my PhD in a CRC that had that collaborative culture and that has been uh, so important for me and I think an exciting opportunity going forward. So that's really all I want to say. There is some scope um, for additional um, partnership. I am biased because I live in northeast Victoria. I would love to see us um, have more investment uh, and then subsequently potentially build a hub in our region. Um, you know, that's really the name of the game is to be able to do that. It's a significant commitment. So that means there needs to be sufficient investment from industry interest, really, and then and investment from partners. So, you know, that's still a possibility um, that we'd be happy to talk about. But I'll stop now because I'm mindful that we'd want to give people an opportunity to ask any questions. So thanks and apologies again uh, for the camera. Thanks. That's right. Thanks, Mike and Sharon, for that update, a bit of a, a history of where, you, where you've been, where you've got to, what the priorities are, and, and also uh, the approach. And I think, you know, that, that was really good to hear everything that uh, you were talking to there, Sharon, about the approach, which is certainly important to all of us um, here, I'm sure, on the line today. Do we have, this is five minutes of interactive time. There's time to ask questions of any of the speakers. There's time to make a comment or an observation. Um, chew the fat together over five minutes. Anyone want to start off with uh, any thoughts? Carl. There you go, Chris. Sorry, I, I bet you were thinking I was not going to say anything, but um, 
I was. No, it's going to just... throw to you in a minute anyway. I was going to say, oh, <laughs> Carl's always got something to say. He'll. <laughs> um, I was just just uh, thinking, and I was recalling when when before this stuff started, and and um, sitting in a room with a bunch of community leaders and others, organisational leaders, etc., and having conversation between a few of the. Um, heads of the organisations and the community people on that table basically said, don't you have joint conversations all the time? And the answer was, no, we don't. And I think from our perspective, particularly in our Water Futures project, that's really come to the fore and what we've been doing is actually this is an opportunity to get organisations on the same table and, and build the capacity of the people who are there. Um, because as Paul highlighted, there's becoming a bit of a dearth of um, of leadership in a lot of, a lot of the orgs. And and this is an opportunity to bring that back again, but that that's why I think this is important. But of interesting comments from Paul, probably or even Mike. Or Lachlan, who's uh, bet between uh, Lachlan Campbell, the Northeast CMA, and Carl uh, here at Golden Broken CMA, they've been really leading this project for us. So thank you for all your organising and all your work, Lachlan. And over to you. Uh, thanks, Chris. I guess I just want to acknowledge the contribution of the agencies in our project, as Paul put up that slide earlier about, of our partners. Um, it's fair to say that uh, those partners have absolutely embraced this opportunity to come together um, to work through this wicked problem of a potentially lower water future. And so I think there's a real um, interest there. And I guess i uh, th throw to you, uh, Mike, just about, um, you know, getting these projects up. Are there still opportunities through the One Basin um, to get you know, novel projects up through the, through the One Basin process if there's other opportunities out there. So I just, can you just walk us through those steps, what that might look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the board's hungry for ambitious projects, I would say. Um, so, uh, I mean, not that, I, mean, I think we're, we're going to be bringing up a few of the, few, few, few to them. It's not like we haven't got, we haven't got there yet. But there's a real appetite to to be be willing to take a few risks and um, and take and 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 try to be ambitious um, in the way that we approach our work. We want to be a value add. I mean, there's a lot of work going on already, um, you know, by state agencies, by the, by, the um, by regional agencies, by you know industry groups. We we want to be a value add and be doing the things that aren't happening um, able to happen elsewhere. Um, so very much so. Um, and, and you know, if you have a look at our palette, you know, the, the plans, the 24 focus areas, as long as it sits broadly within that palette and it's a, and it's a broad palette, um, uh, then um, the way to bring those projects in is to participate in those, uh, those focus, focus group discussions um, around the focus areas. So it's just a matter of um, contacting me or Sharon um or anybody else in the crc leadership team for that matter and and um making the connection and we can um put you in touch with the the leads for that particular focus area and you become part of the group i guess what we're trying to avoid is having just bilateral um, projects with just individual organizations that doesn't really seem to take advantage of the real the partnership that we're, we're bringing um so we're really looking for partners to to engage um with um with other partners um um, uh, in uh, in working in co-designing projects collaboratively, so we you know sums greater than the parts effectively. But yeah, look, we'll, and we'll be going through and and um, also I'm probably going on a bit longer than you'd like, but we'll be going through a planning cycle every every year. We'll we'll put together another set of projects, so it's not like this is the one set of projects and the doors closed. Um, we, we've got the budget um, managed so that we can actually you know plan each year for another another set of projects. Um, and um, and we'll even review those challenges um, every three years as well. So there's there's room for um, an evolution in terms of where we focus our effort. I, I expect that what will happen is over time we'll focus in on the areas where we're really getting traction and, and, ha and having the greatest value. Um, that's what I expect will happen, but that's just uh, my view. Um, and then the CRC is really guided by the partners. All right. Um I think I'm going to have to draw it to a close there. So um, thanks for that that comment back. Um, we'll take on that uh, challenge, Sharon, you put to us around uh, the more projects we get up here, then we might get a, uh, uh, a hub in the region. And we certainly think it's a pretty important region and that, that would be a, a 
great thing for us to, to get to get that. So um, I just want to thank everybody for joining in and being uh, interested uh, to hear about it. And many of you are participating in what we're doing over here and also with the One Basin CRC more broadly. I want to thank Paul, Michael and Sharon for um, the presentations that they gave us today. Um, we at the both Northeast C CMA, Katie, um, introducing it and Goldwyn Broken take the responsibility of engaging our communities in these important conversations very seriously. Um, and we really look forward to continuing to work with all of the agencies involved in water and actually empowering um, and enabling our communities to through that transition and adaptation stage that a changing water future is going to bring. So thanks everyone for joining in. Um, and we'll call it, we'll call it uh, we'll call it there. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris.